Hello and welcome to episode 26 of the Spotlight Games podcast. My name is Patrick and I am joined by that squeaky boy, that little shaky boy with those shoulders and that face. Cayman. Cayman. Oh, uh oh, he's spooky. He's a ghost, folks. How are you? I'm doing great, Patrick. How are you? I'm good. I am, you know, I am I'm energized today, Cayman. I'm ready to talk about video games with you, Cayman. Yeah. I'm ready to dissect to analyze to pontificate Ooh, Ooh. big words uh some yeah i i, I actually have a thesaurus right next to me good yeah. same here i always do yeah uh so yeah i'm i'm excited there's a lot to talk about we have a juicy show today we do there's been some shake up some big news to talk about we got some game reviews to talk about we got some delays to talk about mm. because we got a lot of video game stuff to talk about because this is the Spotlight Games podcast came in where each and every week you and I are going to get together to talk about the latest and the greatest in the world of video games. You can get the podcast by subscribing to our YouTube channel or by subscribing in your favorite podcast app. And hey, while you're in that favorite podcast app, if it supports it, why don't you give us a rating? Why don't you give us a review? Let us know how much you like us or dislike us. But maybe if you dislike us, you just like send me a note and say like, hey, I don't like you instead of giving me a one star review on this podcast. Yeah. But hey, it's free country. Do what you want. Uh, don't forget, you can be on the show by emailing us your thoughts and questions to mail at spotlightgames.net. Or you can DM us on Twitter at spotgamespod or on Instagram at spotlightgamespodcast. We're also on TikTok, but we still haven't posted anything because, you know, life is hard. And sometimes yeah. it's hard to do things that you say you're going to do. Um, Cayman, we're not done with housekeeping because our newest episode of Save Trash Cinema is out. Why don't you tell our listeners oh about the newest episode of Save Trash Cinema? Guys, let me tell you about this new episode of Save Trash Cinema on the episode, which is out while you're listening to this. We have an incredible episode. It's our first ever interview that we've released on Save Trash Cinema. I was lucky enough to interview indie documentarian John Campapiano. Um, he's a super cool guy. He uh, has done documentaries you might have heard of called Unearthed and Untold, The Path to Pet Cemetery. Or what we talk about on the episode, which is his latest documentary he released called Snapper, the man-eating turtle movie that was never made. Uh, we talk about Snapper. We talk about Pet Cemetery, We talk about the legacy of lost films and the impact of trash cinema as a whole. Um, it's a very interesting uh, interview. He's an incredibly smart guy. Uh, he's done a lot of work. He's a film archivist. And he's done a lot of work on a lot of older films and doing like special features for some trash cinema that's been released through some of these uh, varying outlets. Uh, but he's like a, just a genuinely cool guy. And the interview I thought was a ton of fun. There's a lot to learn um, from this interview. Yeah. Um, one of those things, give you a little spoiler if you haven't Ooh. listened yet. We talk about a little known film called The Legend of Gator Face. Um, so if you want to know what the fuck that means, head on over to the Save Trash Cinema podcast and give it a listen because you won't be disappointed. I can say I had nothing to do with this episode. Uh, I just listened today and it's awesome it's a great episode i highly recommend if you've never checked in uh, with safe trash cinema really cool this john fellow seems like an awesome dude uh there's a lot of informative entertaining stuff in that episode so give it a look see um mm -hmm. well came in we have a great show for our listeners on the spotlight games podcast today we're going to be talking about playstation finally revealed the much long rumored project spartacus Unfortunately, Breath of the Wild 2 has been delayed to next year, and we also have some reviews of new video games, namely Kirby the Forgotten Land and Tiny Tina's Wonderland we're going to talk about. But first, Cayman, why don't we start, as we start all of our episodes of this fine show, with what we're playing. Cayman, any updates? What have you been playing? Are you still on Elden Ring? Have we dipped our toes in anything new? Talk to me. Sing to yeah. me. So, um... Elden Ring. Um, bad news, guys. Oh, no. I'm worried that I might have hit a wall. Mm. Um, I'm at the, like the midway point for the story, maybe a little past the midway point. Honestly, I'm not sure of where I am in the story because there really isn't much of a story that I know of because it's everything is so confusing. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I've just kind of hit a wall where 
I can't level up fast enough to be able to tank some of these bosses like I was able to do earlier. So now I'm like very much in the get good stage. Yeah. Um, and man, it, the, the game's just really hard. It's yeah. it's a very difficult game. And um, I've been able to cheese a couple encounters to be able to get past them. Um, look, if the game mechanic allows you to do it, you should be able to do it. So I have. Um, the question is, is, where I am right now, will I continue progressing? I'm going to give it my heart. I really want to beat the game. Like, yeah. I just want to be able to say I beat Elden Ring. It's just a massive game and it's a very hard game. And when you're looking at a game that's 100 plus hours to complete a st the story um, and the game is as challenging as it is, like it's just tough. It's yeah. tough. And, you know, I'm going to put my, I'm going to keep pushing and putting towards it. Um, but as of right now, there is a little bit of a worry that I might have to hang up my great shield and Ray Pierre mm. and um, and just accept that I'm just not good enough for this. <laughs> yeah, I it's interesting. I I still not jumped back in from last week, but um, I'm I've been seeing a lot more discourse online that since we last recorded about like more people being like, all right, I I've reached a point in which. I there's just not much else I can do. Yeah. Um, and I, I feel like I will probably also hit that boat because I mean, the only souls game I've actually finished was demon souls. I hit, the, I hit a point in bloodborne where I was like, I can't, I, mm -hmm. there's just, there is a point in which I am just not good enough. Um, yeah. But we'll see. Um, but I'm, I'm sad to hear that, that it's gotten to a point where you're hitting a wall. Um, you never like it that. happens. It happens. Yeah. yeah. Also, I think too that I'm also kind of running into an issue where I always go, I go through phases, right? Where I stop getting as much satisfaction out of one activity that I've been doing a lot of. And so I tend to fall back on like a separate mm -hmm. activity that, yeah. and that kind of catches me. So I think I'm also kind of getting in, like I'm in a phase, like in a phase right now, a mood, one might say, where I'm more inclined to wanting to, just watch movies uh um, sure which you know i mean we we run another podcast that is about movies so yeah yeah um you know and it's it's tough so obviously trying to balance time i i don't want to to give up yet um and i will keep fighting and keep pushing but like i do like my current inclination when i have some downtime is like let's put on a movie you haven't watched in six months or a movie that's been out that you haven't seen like i've been really craving like really wanting to watch nightmare alley Mm. um and so or coda like there's a lot of like uh, yeah. academy award-winning films or nominee you know best picture nominees that i haven't seen yet um then i'm like yeah maybe i'll just pause elden ring for a little bit and just catch up on a bunch of the movies i haven't yeah. watched so kind of in that how game about game. a how about a quick little tangent uh of the best picture nominees you've watched what what's your best picture for this year came oh shit um I can tell you what it's not, and that's Don't Look Up. That movie wasn't very That good. movie was awful. Yeah. It's one of the only Best Picture nominees that I have seen. Yeah. I think, yeah. honestly, that's probably one of the only ones. I, I don't know, man. I tend to not watch many Best Picture nominees. Gotcha. Um, mainly because I just don't... I don't like the whole jerk-off contest that I feel like a lot of these movies... Apparently, Coda is incredibly good. I have And, like, that. was more than deserving to win. Um... But a lot of these movies, you know, and nothing against, like, I love uh, Guillermo del Toro, so something like Nightmare Alley, like, I would love that. Um, but no, I don't know. I just, like, I love trash cinema. I love movies that are different. And I feel like a lot of these Oscar noms that you get are for movies that are just blasé. Like, sure. they're just, like, well-trodden ground. We've seen a fucking biopic a thousand times, but you better believe there's going to be four of them that are going to be nominated for best picture every year. It's just like a self aggrandizing fucking hand job over here. <laughs> like, like, look, there's movies like, you know what movie should have been nominated. That wasn't hmm. Titan. I you haven't seen say Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> no, not Titanic. <laughs> no, not Titanic this year. And I think that during our awards, I did something with Titanic. I think Con Air was one of my awards last year. Um, no, but like Titan, this incredible art house, French cinema, just absolutely grotesque and gnarly and fucked up and so much fun and didn't even get blinked at. Yeah. 
And like that shit pisses me off. That's why I tend to just be like, fuck this. No, I'm not sure. going to, I'm not going to give my time. Not that these films don't deserve your time. Cause obviously they probably do. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. I just, they just don't speak to you. They're just fine. They, don't, they don't speak to me in the same way. Cause I don't just don't feel like there's like that originality. Sure. You know? Yeah. So. I, um, you know, I, I misinterpreted what you were saying. I was, th- I was thinking that you had been watching them. That's why I asked. Um, Sorry. Uh, no, 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 you're fine. That's fine. Um, so I actually, I want to keep the train rolling of what we've been keep watching it. Okay. Do because so. so in terms of what I've been playing, I've been playing the mm-hmm. new Kirby, which I want to talk about when we talk about Kirby uh, okay. and I've been playing more tunic and I'm still really loving it. Um, still like, yeah, if you have an Xbox, go play tunic, but I watched the halo pilot on Paramount plus, And I want to talk about that because that's relevant to our audience. Right. Um, I've heard so many mixed feelings. So I'm very curious to hear. Yeah. So I, I, Ultimately, I really enjoyed it. And I think I think the short answer is I was a a beneficiary of low hype. Like I had heard so many people be like, this sucks or this is missing the mark. So I went in sure. kind of expecting it to be bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I walked away like, I can't wait for episode two. Um, there are, I'm going to do some light spoilers. So like if you were just interested, like curious about what, I happened to think about it. You want to know, I think it's good or bad. I think it's good. So if you don't want to be spoiled, maybe skip ahead a couple minutes. So I'm going to do just some light spoilers. Um, They, I mean, granted, this is only for the pilots. It's not like high stakes spoilers, but they are telling a different story. And that is the thing that I'm most impressed by with this, that they, like there was a story that came out a couple weeks before it uh, premiered. That was like, apparently they're not really, they're not using the game as like referential material and sure. it, the kind of the, the, um, the lens of that story was like halo show, not even using the video games for its show as like a, this is just going to be nothing like the, the games. And I think what they meant by that is they're not telling the story of halo. They are telling their own story inspired by halo with the same characters in the same world with some similarities, but they're not telling the story of at least so far, Master Chief going on Halo Zeta or whatever it was called. Halo's like I don't even that's the thing. I don't even remember the story of the first Halo. I was gonna I, ask you, I, I was like, is I played what, it like a year ago and I don't even remember what happened. What is um, the you know, I don't want to be a dick when I say this, but to the audience, like, hey, do you remember? Like if you like obviously don't go to Wikipedia and pull up the story. Sure. But like just please audience, email us in and tell me just without looking anything up, tell me the story of Halo because I can promise you right now. I don't know any of that shit and I can't remember any of it. And I've played all of them. Yeah. Cause that's the latest one. So I, yeah. I still don't know anything. For happening sure. Yeah. In that I didn't finish the latest one and I kind of can't even tell you the story of the latest one. But anyway, they like the interesting thing about it is they like from moment one, they are positioning master chief and the Spartans as like mm-hmm. bad guys, like in, in the world of halo, they are like, it kind of opens with, we're on this like random planet and there's like, it's like a mining colony or something. And all of these people that work in this mining colony, it's like very kind of downtrodden, very like in this world, like kind of like uh blue collar kind of like the equivalent of space blue collar uh, town. And uh, they all, there's like a lot of propaganda about how the Spartans are essentially like war criminals and mm. they aren't here to help. Um, and like they're, there's a lot of hate toward the UNSC and the Spartans and and all that kind of thing. And then uh, a group of the covenant comes and like invades this town and starts killing everybody. And then the Spartans show up to save the day essentially. And so this, this kind of from the uh, viewpoint of this town, they're like, wait, I thought they were the bad guys, but maybe they're the good guys. I don't know. But then we start seeing more about like from the perspective, like going into the UNSC and kind of seeing, I forget their names, but, like the people that are kind of in charge of the Spartans and they're like, not good people. Like some of the things that they're like wanting the Spartans to do, I'm like, Oh, maybe you guys are actually bad people. Um, And so essentially the story that they're telling is these Spartans, these super soldiers that are kind of uh, uh, like programmed to be like fight for them. Master chief is like, kind of opening up and like realizing that maybe he needs to be making his own decisions. So like, it's in a way it is very tropey. Like this is a story we've been told before, Um, but it is very much not the halo story. And like, he takes off his helmet in the first episode. So we've already seen his face. And like, there's like, there's a bunch of stuff where like, this is very much 
not Halo the video game, the show. This is very much a Halo series that is inspired by the video game. And honestly, that's what I like that. That's why I'm most impressed with this show is that mm-hmm. they are, they, they're, they have the guts to, to say like, Hey, we're going to tell our own story. All that being said, like there are definitely some, like the, the CGI, not very good. Like, especially when you're like far away, like when there's like, when it's wide shots of the covenant, like the CGI is pretty bad, but like, I, I kind of don't care. Like sure. it, I could see why people would, be nitpicky about that it just doesn't concern me as much Mm -hmm. um and like there some of the dialogue is pretty bad like in in one of the the first scenes when we're kind of meeting the protagonist that's not master chief she's like i just can't wait to get off this rock and i'm like did you really just say that that is like the most tropey line like the most cheesy line i've ever heard but like like, you hear from tremors yeah but like outside of the occasional really bad dialogue they're like there's i i can i i like the kind of the, where it's going and i like the 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 choices that they're making and i think so far uh paul pablo schreiber i think is his name who's playing master chief i think he's doing great like sure he doesn't have the voice but like they're not trying to make his voice the master chief voice and like mm-hmm. we just need to get over that it's not going to sound the same but but yeah if you're interested at all in watching it and have paramount plus i would say give it a shot if you don't have paramount plus i would maybe wait to see kind of like how it pans out and I'll, I'll keep you updated on my thoughts. I might check in every few weeks. I won't like give a breakdown of every episode, but I might check in every few weeks to kind of let you know um, what I'm thinking. But so far I fucks with it. So. All right. You fucks with it. I fucks with it. You're here first folks. You're here to hear first folks. Um, But yeah, so that's a little bit of a, a little bit of a curveball, but not what we've been playing, but what we've been watching. Um, But Cayman, there's about to be a lot that we're going to be playing potentially. Oh Potentially. Potentially. PlayStation finally today announced today as of recording. So Tuesday, the 29th announced what this rumored project Spartacus is. And so this is going to be a fat one came in. This story is going to be big. Mm-hmm. Um, I figure what we can do. Let's go down. I'll, I'll open us off. And then, so there are three tiers. We'll break down the tiers and then let's talk about it. Let's break it apart and see what we let's think. Let's do this. Um, so this is coming straight from the PlayStation blog. This is written by Jim Ryan, president of Sony interactive entertainment. He says since launching PlayStation plus in 2010, Sony interactive entertainment has been at the forefront of innovation with game subscription services. Have you <laughs> Jim Ryan? <laughs> we were thrilled to be the first console membership service that included a refreshed library of games through PlayStation plus and also launched the first console game streaming service with PlayStation. Now today we are pleased to share with you official news about changes coming to our subscription services. This June we're bringing together PlayStation plus and PlayStation now in an all new PlayStation plus subscription service that provides more choice to customers across three membership tiers globally quick pause i want to really briefly describe what playstation plus is and playstation now is for any of our non-playstation listeners um sounds great playstation plus is a a monthly or an annual subscription that you pay for and the perks are you get like two or three free games a month usually they are kind of older maybe three to six months old or, or older with the occasional launch game like a, usually like an indie title they'll launch it at day and date with playstation plus first tuesday of each month we get these new couple new games um, each month and then you also get discounts uh you might save 15 or 20 percent on new games and then you can also like certain games you have to have playstation plus to play online so that's playstation plus uh and then playstation now is like a a really simplified version of like a streaming service where you can download specific games that are on this. It's almost kind of like a Netflix model, but not nearly as impactful as I think game passes, but you can download these games to your hard drive um, and play them. As long as you are a member of PlayStation. Now it's like a set number of games that you can access. You can download them, play them whenever you want, as long as you're paying. Uh, And then there's also a streaming capability for certain games as well, where you can, you don't have to download them. You can just stream them. So essentially what they're doing is they're mashing these two together with some some newer features as well. Did I miss anything came in worth nope. mentioning on those two? Cool. Nailed so con- continuing with the PlayStation blog, he goes on to say, our focus is on providing high quality curated content with a diverse portfolio of games. Below is an overview of the three membership tiers. The first tier came in PlayStation Plus Essential. Mm-hmm. The benefits, this is the exact same benefit as the current PlayStation Plus membership that you're getting. Two yep. monthly downloadable games, exclusive discounts, cloud storage for saved games, and online multiplayer access. No changes to the existing PlayStation Plus model with that one. The price points are $9.99 a month, $24.99 quarterly, or $60 
yearly, which if you do the yearly subscription averages out to $5 a month. The next one, this is when it starts changing. PlayStation yep. Plus Extra. The benefits of this one, all of the benefits of the Essential tier, plus it adds a catalog of up to 400 of the most enjoyable PS4 and PS5 games, including blockbuster hits from our PlayStation Studios catalog and third-party partners. Games in the Extra tier are downloadable for play. The price points here is 15 bucks a month monthly, which is the Game Pass price, $39.99 a month quarterly, or $100 a year annually, which would average out to $8.30 a month. I want to stop here. Okay. What do you think so far of this? Because the, the first one, this is how it's always been. But the second one, what do you think so far of this second PlayStation Plus X? <clears throat> oh, honestly, see, I'm, I'm torn. I think the PlayStation Plus Extra is arguably the biggest bang for your buck. Yeah. Uh, catalog of up to 400 games from PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5. It's, I mean, that's a steal, right? Sure. Depending on the like game. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, and I'm assuming because they've announced what some of the games are going to be on launch day, which are pretty impressive yeah. um, and pretty exciting. So, you know, I think that it's good. I I, I think the, the big thing here is that they're maintaining standard PlayStation Plus as is. Yeah. Uh, my worry was that that would be eliminated entirely and it would gotcha. move to a monthly model like this. Sure. Um, I will say that breaking it down and being like, hey, we, we can give you, you can pay for the yearly subscription is an interesting choice. It's something that Game Pass does not offer. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of nice because you're getting a big discount if you want to fork the money up front, assuming yeah. that you're going to enjoy this service for a long time. Um, when we get down to the next tier, I actually looked this up earlier, you would be saving essentially $60 a year between the, the top line tier for PlayStation Plus now compared to Game Pass. So I think that that is interesting that they do give you that option to pay more up front to save considerable amounts of money. Um yeah, it's it's I almost wonder if this will kind of make Xbox start offering an annual subscription because this mm -hmm. middle tier, I mean, this is the price of of Game Pass. So yeah. at, at the monthly price. So like now, because, yeah, what what's what's 15 times 12, 15 times 12. So you're paying one hundred and eighty dollars a year mm -hmm. yep. for Game Pass. Whereas with this, yeah, you pay a hundred bucks and you're uh, getting 400 of the most enjoyable PS4 and PS5 games. The big question mark, obviously, is going to be, what, well, what are those games? They have yeah. said there's going to be like Returnal. Later on, we'll kind of go through some of the ones that they highlight. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it's interesting. Um, so yeah, let's jump on to the next one, and then let's continue. So PlayStation Plus Premium, all the benefits of Essential and Extra Tiers. It adds up to 340 additional games, including PS3 games available via cloud streaming. So... Ultimately, you can't download any PS3 games, which kind of stinks um, because you're at the mercy of the internet at that point. Also, a catalog of beloved classic games available in both streaming and download options from the original PlayStation, PS2, and PSP generations. This also offers cloud streaming access for original PlayStation, PSP, PS4 games that are offered in the extras and premium tiers in markets where the PlayStation Now is currently available. And they can also stream them on their PC uh, as well as PS4 and PS5. Mm -hmm. And then this is kind of the other thing that sets this one apart. Time-limited game trials will also be offered in this tier so customers can try select games before they buy. So I'm interested to see what those select games are. Like, is it going to be their first party? Like, can I try Last of Us Part 3 before I buy it? Uh, I don't know. Yes. We'll, we'll see. I think that's probably what they're going to go for, though. Um, and then so the price for this one, $17.99 a month, $49.99 quarterly, or $120 for the year, which is averaging out to be $10 a month. So it's not that big of a jump from PlayStation Plus Extra. Um, $8 a month compared to base PS Plus, and then it's double the price compared to the annual price of the base PS Plus. So my, you know, my kind of biggest takeaway from this, honestly, Cayman, is I am pleasantly surprised. Like, I know when, when we, a lot of kind of the scuttlebutt about this was... Well, it's never going to have, you know, God of War Ragnarok day one. So is it even worth it? But like when you consider that on an annual basis, I would only be paying $10 a month 
So it is double what I'm paying now because now I'm paying $60, which is $5 a month. But I feel like they are giving me what is worth another $5 a month in value mm -hmm. on average. Mm -hmm. Like I, I will not be paying $18 a month. That is a waste of my money. Because yeah. like if, if here's what I'll say, and then I want to get more of your thoughts. If they weren't offering me the annual option, I would be very disappointed by this. I think is, sure. is where, what it comes down to because there is significant savings by doing it annually. Yeah. No, I, I agree 100%. Yeah. I would like to just first point out the hilarity that is PlayStation 3 games are available via cloud streaming, not download. And I think that's really funny to me yeah. that like Sony bungled the PS3 so poorly. Yeah. That they still to this day don't know how to get games that were made for the PlayStation 3 to play on anything else. <laughs> anything. <laughs> um, and it's in, that's absolutely insane to me. Yeah. Um, one caveat that they did leave out um, that I thought was interesting is that it mentions the original PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2, PlayStation 3, PSP, PlayStation 4, PlayStation mm. 5. No mention of PlayStation Vita. No mention of PlayStation Vita. That's interesting. And, you know, at first I'm like, you know what? They probably didn't mention PlayStation Vita because it doesn't have the back touch screen. But, like, there's got to be ways around that. Like, there's the there's the front touch pad. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting. Like, it, I mean, it, but you think about games like uh, Persona 4 Golden, for instance, or yeah. Freedom Wars. Didn't use the back touch pad. And those were two of the biggest games, the games that people enjoyed the most. Huh. Um on the PlayStation Vita. So, you know, it, it makes you wonder, like, if if you would assume that if they were to not include that, there's a reason why they're not including that. Yeah, that's um, a really good point. It wouldn't be something that they would just be like, oh, yeah, 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 the PlayStation Vita games, like, you'll, you'll get some. They would put the name there. Because um, if they don't include, like, if they put the name there and they don't include any PlayStation Vita games, that's potentially a lawsuit. Sure. So, yeah, wow. They're they're including every single PlayStation generation except the Vita. Yeah, which is interesting. That is interesting. Um, it's a disappointment. I never did even consider that, yeah. but I mean, I'm I still have mine and it still works as of today, but Yeah. But I'm yeah, cuz like they're like with yeah, with Persona 4 Golden is like the big one. Yeah. Where like I want to be able to play that on my TV. Yeah. And like I could cool. if I bought a PC and did it like streaming to my my TV, but like Yeah. That's just that seems extra. Yeah, um, it kind of makes you wonder if it's just the fact that there's like such a limited amount of games that people would want to play. Maybe, yeah, and that you know that's why. Um, but no, I think ultimately the big draw here, like sure, an additional 340 games. So you're looking at almost 750 games at launch day. That's impressive. Sure. Uh, I don't know what the Game Pass catalog looks like currently. Um, but that's impressive, right? Yeah. And, you know, obviously within the 740 games that you're going to get, uh, there's going to be some stinkers. There's oh, just no for question sure. about that. There's going to be some stinkers. But this could be a great opportunity for people to sneak in and be like, hey, you know, I never mm -hmm. played you know, the Sly Cooper games when they came out. And this is a perfect opportunity for me to be able to do that. That's a cool option by including that. Um, but the big, big thing for me is the time-limited game trials. And like to your point, the question is, is which games? Yeah. Because they say select games. So that makes you think like, okay, well, you're definitely not going to get all of them. Like I would assume we'll get any PlayStation Studios game. Yeah, I assume that is that too. Um, but you know, like, okay, for instance, um, Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, right? Um, I am a big Borderlands guy, so that works for me and plays in my favor that I already know. I don't need to play a demo for that game to be able to say like, this is a game I want to play. Yeah. But for someone like you, who has never really jived with the Borderlands, which is fair. Uh, but, you know, if, say if they gave you, hey, you get four hours demo. to play I would like, absolutely that do that. Be. And it yeah. might convince me. Because, like, I, I liked Borderlands 1, and I enjoyed Borderlands 2 fine. It just got to the point where, like, by 3, I felt like I had played 
the same game. And like, yeah. I think it's a good game. I just was kind of tired of that game. And so I was excited that Tiny, Tiny Tina's Wonderland seems to be changing the formula formula a little bit until reading the reviews and it sounded like they didn't actually change it as much as I thought they were going to. Mm-hmm. However, if I could jump in there for four hours and just fuck around and see, like there is a strong chance that they would win me over. And yeah. so, yeah, yeah. So that is very exciting as well. Yeah. I, um, I do think ultimately like the, the, the main, so many people have been saying like, this is going to be the answer to game pass. And now that I'm seeing what it is, I don't think it's the answer to game pass. I just think this is the best that PlayStation can do because they've already said, I forget where it was. And I, I couldn't find it before we jumped in. Um, Jim Ryan has already been on record since this posted with another outlet saying you will not see God of War Ragnarok day one. That's just not our model. That's not, yeah. this is not what PlayStation plus is there an official name for it? I guess premium there's, this isn't what PlayStation plus premium is. That's not the, the benefit. And the reason for that, he basically said, I'm, I'm paraphrasing obviously, but he was like, we can't continue to give you God of War Ragnarok. If we give it to you as part of this, we need you to buy it for us yeah. to fund it. So if you want, keep wanting those games, that's how it's going to happen, which like, sure, that's fine, whatever. Um, but yeah, I like when comparing it with game pass, when you're just looking at dollars and cents where on average $10 a month versus $15 a month for game pass, I am getting halo day one. I am getting the new gears mm-hmm. day one and I'm, I am getting all Bethesda days games day one. I'm getting a lot of these third party games day one that they work out deals with. But a lot of the, 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 in my opinion, a lot of the, the rest of the um, library leaves a lot to be desired for, for sure. the rest of game. I feel like the, the, the main benefit with game pass is new releases because the amount of first party studios now, because of Bethesda is insane. But past that, there is a lot of the time they'll be like, here's the eight new games coming to game pass. And I really only care about one of them. And it's the newest mm-hmm. release. Um, you know, it, and, the, and part of me wonders, right? Like there's a lot of logistics involved in both game pass and and with the new playstation plus but a big thing for me is like the financial side that i'm more curious about Mm -hmm. obviously microsoft is significantly larger in terms of like you know and sony does too you know they got their motion pictures and they've got their technology side but like microsoft is just a bigger company right there are there are bigger microsoft is bigger unfortunately you there's just no way around that But you have to wonder how much money are they making or how much money are they losing when it comes to this? Because games are not cheap to develop. Yeah. And they're not just developing Halo or Gears of War or Forza. They will soon be developing Call of Duty. Um, They will soon be developing all Bethesda games. Yeah. Yeah. And so how much money are they really making? Because you're thinking like a game today costs what anywhere from 50 to $200 million to make a game. Yeah. A a large game, like one of these big triple a games, they're not cheap. Mm -mm. You know, these are not cheap at all. And, you know, you've got companies like Disney who, if their movies aren't breaking 600 to $800 million at the box office every time, like they're losing money in the process of that. And it, it makes me wonder if ultimately at the end of the day, if we will see, and it goes back to the same argument before where it's, will we see some of these Xbox properties now starting to make their way cross console? So obviously we know, at least from what Microsoft has said, uh, PlayStation will still get call of duty, but things like, you know, are we going to get the next Skyrim game is going to be cross console? Are we going to get some of these other games? Is that like, will they do that to try to make up money? Because now you're in a situation where arguably PlayStation's offering something that's comparable. It, it might not have the same boost of being like, well, you can't get Halo. You can't get God of War Ragnarok day one. However, you do get everything else, right? Yeah. Yeah. You get all of this other stuff that you want. So how much is that going to siphon away from people who have um, who've decided to stay with Xbox 
instead of sure. because of Game Pass. And you you would assume that they're going to like Microsoft will be losing customers to this. Yeah. It's just going to happen. Um, just like Sony lost customers to Microsoft because of Game Pass. So now the market's going to be a little bit more even. Now, how much money is our you know, is Microsoft going to be losing by offering up their games as a day one? I don't sure. think Microsoft ever takes a step back from that. I don't think that they're going to say, hey, we're no longer offering our games day one. We can't financially. Right. So either you're going to see a price hike in how much Game Pass is going to cost, which then puts the advantage on PlayStation, because I don't think PlayStation needs to do anything different. Sure. Like they can just be like, no, this is fine. Like we're we're totally content with charging what we're charging because of what you're getting yeah so either you're gonna see a price hike from game pass or you're gonna start seeing and this is just complete conjecture here you're gonna start seeing some of these microsoft exclusives probably some of the ones from parties that they've picked up coming over and being you know cross console yeah you could um i have some some rough numbers for you came in Okay, hit me some rough numbers. As of January 2022, okay. there are 25 million subscribers to Game Pass. Okay. Assuming all of them pay $15 a month, which well, a month, which not all of them do, but I would assume most of them do because they always do these like $1 a month for three month deals. Let's just assume all of them are paying $15 a month. That comes out to $375 million a month, which comes out to $4.5 billion a year in revenue. Mm-hmm. PlayStation. I'm paraphrasing this number. I, I remember reading this in an article earlier, but I don't remember where it was. But between PlayStation Plus and PlayStation Now last year, or maybe this fiscal year, I don't remember. Sometime recently, they brought in, it was like $3.4 billion of revenue from their their uh, PlayStation Plus plus PlayStation Now. So the market tells me and logic tells me that with these new tiers, they are going to make more money. So oh, yeah. I would assume they will probably make upwards of four plus billion dollars next year with this. Yeah, I would think. And so that really puts all of this into perspective for me, assuming that I am remembering that PlayStation number correctly, which I think I am. I mean, that PlayStation number sounds like that would be logical. And so so right now, I'm, I believe it was 3.4. So 3.4 billion versus 4.5 billion. So a little less than a billion in revenue, which makes sense. But I would assume that PlayStation starts to close that gap. So the question mark then becomes how many more subscribers does Game Pass get with adding things like Call of Duty? I don't know. Maybe more. Maybe it stays the same. But um, and I mean, 4.5 billion and 3.4 billion is a lot of fucking money. So like true, true. But you're also what we're not taking into consideration is essentially one month of Game Pass could cover the cost of one big release for Microsoft if you're including marketing and all that stuff. That's not including any contracts or deals that have been made to have other games that are not just, you know, Microsoft first party, something like Tunic, for instance. Right, right. Whatever they're paying for that as well to now have as a day one. Yeah. Um. It's yeah, interesting. This is gonna be. I look. It, I hate saying the console wars because I think console wars is just a really stupid thing. But I would say that the console wars are going to get even more heated now. What we um, need, Jason Shire. I know. I know you're listening. Yes, Jason. Hello. We need a big think piece about like what break down these numbers for us for us small folk, like. What kind of revenue is Sony making a year and Xbox more so Xbox? What are they making a year with this compared to get like with their game sales and all those things? I want to know how much revenue are they actually making in the Xbox game division versus the the PlayStation Sony interactive entertainment division. Write it for us. I know you're listening. I know it'd be pretty. It'll take a weekend. There, right. there's going to be there's going to be some huge article that's going to come out probably in the next couple of weeks that's going to detail and be like this is and it's going to show the breakdowns and it'll show like how much an average game costs for per studio and then how many those games get released a year and yeah. then you know all the development time and all that stuff and this is not even considering that how much money is lost just on canceled projects sure yeah, um, that's a great because point. there's millions of dollars that are lost just on canceled projects alone yeah 
Um, that's that's an enticing conversation to yeah. have. I would, I would love to listen and have that conversation. Yeah. Um, a couple just quick things to kind of wrap this up. Um, the rest of this article kind of talks about like dates and games and that kind of thing. So I'll just kind of skim through this really quickly. Um, uh, let's see. The new extra and premium tiers represent a major evolution for PlayStation Plus. With these tiers, our key focus is to ensure that the hundreds of games we offer will include the best quality content that sets us apart. At launch, we plan to include such titles as Death Stranding, God of War, Marvel Spider-Man, Marvel Spider-Man Miles Morales, Mortal Kombat 11, this is a random one to add in, and Returnal. We're working closely with our imaginative imaginative developers from PlayStation Studios and third-party partners to include some of the best gaming experiences, blah, 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 blah. Uh, they go on to say that this is they plan to uh, launch this in June, starting in uh, various Asian markets, then North America, then Europe, and the rest of the world. Their goal is to have all of this out in all markets by the end of June, 2022, the end of the first half of 2022. So we'll see. I assume we'll be hearing about this uh, in a little bit. I saw some, some thing on Twitter today. The reason we're hearing about this so far in advance, Sony's fiscal year ends in like a few days. So mm -hmm. they're announcing all this to be like, Hey, we're going to make a lot more money next year with this other thing. That's why we're hearing about it so far in advance. Um, Cause usually I feel like these kinds of things, don't have much of a lead time but um but yeah so that's kind of the state of it that this is that project spartacus that's long been rumored ultimately like i said pleasantly surprised this is yeah it, i mean it kind of lines up fully with what the rumors were but actually seeing it word for word and seeing those prices and realizing that it's actually less per month on average than game pass has me not as critical about what they're offering than i thought i would be so I'll probably be moving yep. to the premium tier personally. Um, yeah, I think so too. Especially for people like us who run a show like this, getting getting just the access to yeah. essentially demos yeah. um, is a game changer because yeah, that can sure. help us make sure that we're spending our money wisely for sure um, and being able to keep up to date with every current event. So yeah, I think yeah. that's a, I, th I think premiums a solid get. And if you don't do premium, I still think the extra. Tier is a good option is, yeah. is a great option um yeah well I like we will it. be monitoring this i'm sure we'll have some some juicy segments like playstation plus premium pick of the week uh when this launches later this year but for now that is all in the world of playstation so that was some good news came in how about some bad news unfortunately give me some bad give me some bad news. i don't want to be the bearer of bad news this is especially bad news for evan brando who oh, yeah, his first or second overall pick in our fantasy critic draft was The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild 2 sequel working title. A Nintendo of America announced today on the 29th via Twitter in a short little video uh, with Aiji Onuma, who's the producer of the Zelda series, that they're delaying the game, unfortunately, to spring of 2023. Essentially, uh, what they were saying was, their dream of this game and all of the things they want to do. Unlike breath of the wild, it will not just be on the ground. We're going to be going to the air and he kind of teased that like, maybe we're going to be doing more than just going to the air in this game. So maybe we'll have some, something else. I don't know what that means. Um, but basically they're saying we need more time. And so yeah. they said spring 2023. Um, I, I think they were very purposeful came in and not giving us a month because I mm -hmm. think we could potentially still see this later than spring of 2023, but I would be willing to bet like at best we see this April 2020. Uh, we see this April, 2022, uh, three. I mean, I think that's best. Case yeah. Scenario. It's like, I, I, like I said, when we were doing our fantasy critic picks, like we hadn't heard anything about Breath of the Wild 2 in a while. And we all have to temper expectations due to the fact that, you know, it's been two years that COVID has been going on and the right. pandemic has slowed down quite a bit. Um, you know, not to mention all the other shit going on in the world right now that's not great. Um, you know, we have to temper expectations. Yeah. That's why I didn't choose it when we chose our games because... I didn't realistically see this game launching in yeah. 2022. 2023, spring of 2023, sounds way more realistic. Um, 
way more realistic. And honestly, I could even see that I can even see them pushing that back to summer, you know, putting mm-hmm. it out in late or, or I mean, hell, if it, I guess it depends on what they consider spring, because uh, if they could still consider May being part of spring, then I could see a, a May launch. Sure. Spring. Um, because that's that seems more realistic to me than than anything coming out in 2022. I like yeah. I said, I think on the last episode, I still don't think God of War Ragnarok's coming out this year. I agree. I yeah, I still think it's probably a February release. Um, and, and we just have to be understanding. Like things slow down. That the, the adjustment for normal people who work in an office to work from home, like. Sure, it takes a couple weeks to get the kinks worked out, and that's fine. But making a video game is like drastically <laughs> yeah. different. And yeah. so that adjustment period, the technology, the things that you need to have in your home, the computers and all the stuff that you need is way different than me just being like, hey, I'm taking my MacBook home and I'm going to work from home for a few months right, or a couple of years. Um, you know, these people are having to like th- their computers are, are essentially building game materials. Like that's way more. Yeah. Than just what you you're not just on hand. Slack messaging your coworkers. Exactly. So, you know, it, this makes sense. And do I feel bad for Evan? Absolutely fucking not. Yeah. Do no I want to crush him and his dreams? Hundred percent. Correct. So, so, so yeah, Evan, uh, I know you're listening. Yeah. And if you're not, first of all, fuck you. Second of all, I'll probably clip this out and post it on Instagram and tag you and say, Evan, get fucked. Get You're going down. Going down, bro. You're going down. Cayman doesn't even know this, but I'm I'm you know coming up on his tail. I got some some hot picks coming in. He has no idea. I'm about to T bone him. He has no idea what's coming. I'm about to Kirby put my mouth around him and and I'm about to become Cayman. And oh. you're just gonna be in the you're gonna be in the wind fucking done. Sorry. Bro. I'm sorry. Can we like take a step back there? You're about to put your, your mouth around me. Oh yeah. I said what I said, and I'll say it again. Say it again. I'm going to put my mouth around you like Kirby and I'm going to become Cayman Kirby. And the thing is, you get to choose where that is. I mean, you know, in the world of Kirby, I'd be putting around your entire body, but my mouth's not that big. So we'll have to figure out something else. We'll have to compromise. I think we can come up with a compromise. We'll talk after the show. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, ultimately, Breath of the Wild 2 delayed. Um, I'm disappointed, but I am also like... I'm so fine with this because ultimately what this means is they're going to give me a better game and I would rather have a better game. Um, But the news is the news. And today the news is a little sad. Let's talk a little bit about Let's just ride that Kirby wave came in. Let's ride that. We got got raunchy there for a second. We did. And, we did. Uh, we normally don't get that raunchy on this oh, show. Save to our cinema is disgusting. It's, that is a raunch. This fact. show is is way more put together. Yeah. So I have been playing uh, Kirby in the Forgotten Land. Tell me all about it. And uh, so we have a little bit of a reviews roundup for that game as well. We're gonna pull an IGN in the GameSpot review, but first I want to give you a little bit of my impression. So um, I. I'm probably two hours into this video game. I've not played a bunch. I've probably gone through like six or seven of the levels. Um, mm-hmm. I'm having a blast. I uh, I didn't expect to buy this game as we had shared on the previous episode, but I got got came in. I saw on Twitter, Janet Garcia, uh, who works with places like kind of funny men, Max formerly of IGN um, has her own outfit pinned to pixels. You should follow her. She's great. If you like video games and video game content, she's awesome. Uh, she posted a thing. She pre-ordered Kirby via Walmart and was getting, uh, I, I don't know why I didn't bring it in here to show. I f- totally forgot uh, that if you pre-ordered with Walmart, you got a little Kirby pop socket. And I'm a sucker for that kind of shit. So sure. I pre-ordered it, even though I wasn't planning on buying it just to get the pop socket, uh, which funnily enough, the pop socket looks great with the spotlight games pop socket wallet. Again, I should have brought it, but it goes right here. That pink matches perfectly with our logo. Yeah. Um, but anyway, all of that to say, I got Kirby, the forgotten land. I'm playing it and I am genuinely blown away by how much I like this video game. Hell yeah. Um, my, my only, really my only complaint 
is that it, it's the, it kind of falls into the same trap that a lot of Nintendo games fall into, which is that it's really easy. Mm. But like, I understand that this game is also, I mean, it's rated E for everyone. So like, of course yeah. it is going to be easy. Like they want everyone age 10 and up to play it. So like, I just, sure. I wish they had built in something that made it a little more difficult, but mm. ultimately I, I'm having a great time. I think um, it is like a weird mashup between Super Mario Galaxy. No, I'm sorry. Super Mario Odyssey mm -hmm. and um, like Super Mario 3D World. Okay. Um, I like the sound of that. Yeah. Like it's it's these 3D levels that are like 2D-ish. Like you're not, the camera's not right behind Kirby. Like you're not, it doesn't feel like a 3D Mario game, but it is in a 3D space. It just has, it's like the, the camera's fixed um, like, a, like a 2D Mario game. Um, but, and then with, with Kirby, you know, I've not played many Kirby games. I don't think this is a normal Kirby mechanic, but there are certain things in the world where if you like suck them up as Kirby, you like become them essentially kind of mm -hmm. like super Mario Odyssey. Um, so there's like one of the, the first one you do is a car. So you, you like, it's called car mouth, I think where you, you, like Kirby, the only thing that's coming out of, uh, Kirby is like the wheels of the car and Kirby is kind of otherwise completely around the, the rest of the car. And so you're driving around as this car and there's like certain puzzles that are built around like with this mechanic in mind. And yeah, I'm having a great time. And also like the, you might remember if you've listened to former episodes of, of the podcast, it's like set in this post-apocalyptic world where it like, it, it it's like you're playing Kirby in the world of the last of us. If the last of us was made for children and insane. I love it. It is so insane. funny. It's amazing. Like I'm going through this mall that is just completely fucking destroyed, but it's still incredibly cute. And yeah, I, if you're considering picking it up, if you like the same kind of games that I like, uh, if you like Mario Odyssey, those kinds of games, you're going to love it. Um, the only potential other feedback that i have um and i say potential because i haven't finished the game but i hear the game is very short so like mm -hmm. if a five to six hour experience in your mind is not worth sixty dollars wait until it's a little bit on sale which for nintendo might be fucking five years yeah. um but that's the only other thing is um it, it sounds like it, it's a pretty short game so uh i will report back next week i'll probably have it beaten by next week but so far i am very very pleased um and ultimately, Cayman, the rest of the internet is too because the reviews are pretty positive. Um, hit me, hit me, Cayman, if you wouldn't mind, if you would oblige with sure. uh, the IGN's review from Tom. Yep. So this comes from Tom Marks at IGN. He gave it an eight out of ten. Tom says Kirby in the Forgotten Land successfully warps the series' already fun mix of ability-based combat, platforming, and secret hunting into the third dimension. The post-apocalyptic setting may not be as thematically interesting as Planet Popstar, but it is still lovely and vibrant with cleverly designed levels that make con consistently smart use of Kirby's abilities. Despite the change in perspective, Forgotten Land maintains most of what I love about classic Kirby games. And if the future means more 3D adventures for our hungry pink hero, I'd be more than happy to swallow them up. Sounds like someone else I know. Hey, hey. Ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba. Uh, GameSpot uh, was a little higher on it. Not that that wasn't high, but GameSpot sure. gave it a nine out of 10. This is Steven Petit. Steven says Kirby in the Forgotten Land is one of those games that's hard to play without constantly having a silly smile on your face. It's far more than just a cute and charming platformer with color colorful visuals, though. This is one of the best platformers on Nintendo Switch, thanks to its brilliantly designed stages and a dynamic arsenal of abilities that consistently shake up the moment-to-moment -moment platforming in action. And Frank and Kirby, if you're reading this review, please don't eat me. I don't have any cool powers anyway. Um, so yeah, ultimately, the internet is very pleased. I think the Metacritic is like an 85 on it. Nice. Um, yeah, so that's awesome. I sneakily added this to my team, got a sweet 15 points. Uh, added in that's why i, I kind of mentioned i'm coming up on your tail sure um, sure okay <laughs> but uh i mean there's a chance you still probably will win this anybody's game considering we'll i've got a couple duds sure uh, elden ring though 32 Ooh. elden ring yeah elden Ooh. ring really helped there but yeah so i i got it on physical so cayman i'm gonna be giving you my copy when i'm done with it and if there's nice. anyone else that i know personally that listens to this podcast when cayman's done with it if you want to borrow it let me know but yeah ultimately very pleased very pleased so far Good, good to hear. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to play it. Um, you know, with Nintendo Switch games, I seem to be more inclined more often than not to stick to like 
JRPGs. I just yeah. really love the handheld JRPGs. Um, platformers I like to to play on the big screen. Um, so, but then again, I say that um, my fiance is currently addicted to Stardew Valley, same as uh, yeah, Patrick's is. wife, and um, boy, it, it runs it runs together. Um, and so, will I have access to use the Switch anytime soon? Probably not. Uh, but that's okay because guess what? There's a new fucking Borderlands game that just came out, baby. Um, I will. Uh, I will start us off. Please start that's us off. All right with you. I'll start us off. Oh, so it's all right. this comes from IGN Travis Northrup, who gave it an eight out of ten. And uh, Travis Northrup says, "Tiny Tina's Wonderlands is a fantastic fantasy take on Borderlands tried and true looter shooter formula." As spinoffs go, it sticks dangerously close to its past successes, which at times felt a bit unoriginal in some of the new stuff it tries, like procedurally generated combat encounters didn't pan out terribly well. Luckily, the excellent writing, hilarious performances from an all-star cast, and ridiculous combat continue to shine brightly and make this tabletop-inspired explosion fest absolutely worth your time. Yeah, that write-up does get me like whenever this game is on sale i do want to give it a shot because that mm -hmm. travis makes it sound like a lot of fun which i know yeah. it's going to be i just reading darren's review from GameSpot, which i'll read in a second that's one of those ones where it's like mm, maybe i don't want to jump to this as immediately but so this is what darren says darren gave it a seven out of ten as a spinoff, Tiny Tina's Wonderlands doesn't reinvent the Borderlands wheel with its shift towards fantasy that bears a chaotic neutral alignment. Instead, it explores familiar territory that repeats the best and worst of the Borderlands formula, and it doesn't venture out of its comfort zone. That makes for a game that is packed with solid first-person shooter action and a competent multi-class system for creating an interesting fate maker. Tiny Tina's Wonderlands retreads the same mechanical and narrative ground as Borderlands 3, ultimately creating a chapter in the franchise that's fun but forgettable mm. so definitely that is kind of what i was afraid of the way that that sure. darren puts it but the way travis puts it makes me you know when this game's a little on sale maybe i will pick it up so yeah um i mean here's my take and this is from uh an avid borderlands player the I, biggest borderlands fan i know yeah i platinumed the first on the playstation 3 um beat all of play the Borderlands 2 from start to finish. Never got the Platinum, but I did play all of it and all of the DLC. Uh, played the uh, Handsome Jack collection that included the pre-sequel. Um, I also played and beat Borderlands 3. I love the Borderlands games. I enjoy playing them, whether it's solo, whether it's couch co-op, whether it's online co-op. I really enjoy Borderlands. I enjoy the looter shooter aspect. If they always feel, and from what I've read, um, this one in particular, the procedurally generated dungeons feel a lot like they were ripped directly out of Diablo, which I love Diablo. There's something about these games that I like. I enjoy the humor, all the game mechanics, the looter shooter feel, that rinse and repeat cycle. That's what I enjoy the most about Borderlands. None of the complaints that I see on either of these reviews or any of the reviews that I've read so far scare me at all. Sure. This is exactly what I was expecting going in. This is exactly what I want to see and what I want to hear. Would I like to see more of a shakeup in the formula? That's kind of a toss up because the truth of the matter is I enjoy you Borderlands love because it's Borderlands. Yeah. If, you know, if they were to be like, hey, we're moving to a third person perspective and we're now a like a like a like the Gears of War style where you slide up behind barricades and then shoot from behind barricades. I'd be like, man, no, I don't like that. Like, I like that chaotic, just blow shit up kind of stuff that you get specifically with Borderlands. And I don't think, you know, I've never played a game, a first person shooter, at least that really captures what Borderlands does so well. And so if you were to just take Borderlands and just strip out the Borderlands part and make something new, like I don't know if I would have enjoyed that as much. Sure. So for me personally, this does not bother me in the slightest. However, if you are someone who never really got into Borderlands because of all those things that make Borderlands Borderlands, then I can 100% understand where, where you would just wouldn't enjoy this as much. Yeah. And that's totally okay. Um, like I always say, and what Patrick always says, Find a reviewer 
that you like, find a reviewer that has similar tastes that you do, see what they say. And if you're on the fence and you know you want to know exactly, then I would just say find someone who that you appreciate their content and you think that they speak to you and give that a shot. Um, I am excited to pick it up. I'm, I haven't picked it up yet, and the only reason I haven't picked it up is because – I'm afraid if I pick it up and start playing it, I won't pick Elden Ring back up and it will just sit there. Sure. And that's a bit of a worry for me. So that's why I've been very hesitant on it. But I think for me, at least speak going off of the reviews and all the content that I've seen, like I'm totally okay with this and you can give an eight out of 10, you can give a seven out of 10, you can net like, I think the open critics, what like a 78. You, uh, you got nine points to 79, 79. That's totally fine. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I, I think, and that's, we get back to the whole point of like reviews are subjective. Um, something like Elden Ring, for instance, got 32 points yeah. from the open credit. So, you know, I think that goes to show that not every game that you're going to enjoy is going to review as a masterpiece. It's just yeah. not going to. And there's a chance that I might play Tiny Tina's Wonderlands and enjoy it way more than I enjoy sure. it. There's a really good chance that'll happen. And you know what? That's fine. Um, And I, you know, as long as I beat Patrick and Evan, which I don't think I have any issues about beating Evan at this point. Yeah, Evan's fine. Um, (laughs) um, Yeah, let's do a quick, a quick update. So actually, let's do a quick update. Is this what I, so Evan has 13 points. The only game of his that's released is, is Pokemon Legends Arceus, which got him 13 points. Um, The other kind of, the only other game that is officially not coming out for him is now Breath of the Wild 2. So he still has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven games uh, supposedly that are going to come out. So we'll see uh, if any of those hit. Um, I am currently, so when I updated this doc this morning, I was at 55 points. But since then, I guess some reviews came out for a memoir blue which is a game we didn't cover with reviews it's another sneaky one that i put in to try and sneak some points it dropped all the way down to five points so that one it it took me from i'm at 48 points so i'm averaging 12 points a game um cayman you are at 83 points so the only game on yours that is officially a no-go is suicide squad kill the justice league which we didn't talk about it on either of the last two episodes, but it was just officially delayed till next year. So you technically still have two games that are coming out, but you still also have four game slots to add new games. You have 83 points, which is averaging 13.8 points per game. So you're definitely, of the three of us, you are averaging the most per game, and that Elden Ring is definitely the, the main um, kind of reason at the moment that you're kind of kicking our asses. Um, and yeah, for me, I still have... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine games that I haven't come out, but I maxed out my my lineup. Okay, so I still have time to go in and find. You have time to go in and find, and like I, I shouldn't have added a memoir blue. I knew it was a risk, but we'll see. So the ones that I've added that you didn't know I added are okay. Xenoblade Chronicles Three, which on air we had talked about me maybe adding yeah. that one. I went ahead and just added it, pick. and then yeah. Kerbal Space Program Two. That one Ooh. I actually picked. Yeah. Friend of the show, listener of the show, Adam Youngblood. Hi, Adam. I love you. I miss you. He messaged me one time and was like, hey, why didn't anyone pick up Kerbal Space Program and, too? And I was like, is it going to be good? And he was like, I think so. And I'm like, okay, I'm trusting you. So this one is entirely on Adam. If it, if it fucks me, it's because of Adam. I think have, and I'll bring him on the show and, and yell at him <laughs> on the show. I actually think that Adam is right. And if I were to have been sneaky like you and have gone in to do any of this, I would have picked it up because the original Kerbal Space Program reviewed incredibly well. And it's been a while since that game came out and have a feeling the refined aspects that they'll implement into two are going to be significant enough to to give you some really good points. Um, Hopefully. Then again, I say that. That was my exact reasoning for picking Dying Light (laughs) 2. Yeah. And I fucked the duck. (laughs) Yeah. So um, you know, the two fire. the two that are remaining for you is Starfield, which could that's total yeah. wild card. That could be huge. That could be a flop. And then uh, a, a Plague Tale Requiem, which I think mm. that one is probably I, I would guess anywhere from ten to fifteen points for that yeah. one. I would think. I think probably both of those are ten to fifteen points. Yeah. So. And then for me, Cuphead, that is delicious last course, which is supposed to come out pretty soon. Bayonetta 3, which might not even come out. Mario and Rabbids, Sparks of Hope. Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order sequel, which I think I'm going to drop that one because I feel mm-hmm. like 
and if we don't hear from it soon, I don't think it's coming out. Um, yeah, and then Stray the and Forspoken are my last two. Yeah, Forspoken, well. that one's a little worrisome. A little bit of little, yeah, that one's a wild, wild card. card. But I think Stray is going to get you is going to get you some points. Hopefully, we'll see. It'll be I think between the two of us, it'll be a tight race. And as normal fantasy goes, um, Evan's going to do poorly. Though I will say he did win this past season in fantasy football. Even though I don't know how he did that, I think he cheated. He, he uh, so he didn't end up winning. Oh, he uh, did. He lost. He, he he did the thing that he did. I think it was the year before uh, where his team he was unstoppable, out. and then he just fucking didn't care anymore at like the last few weeks, and then he went out in the playoffs. But if he had tried, he would have kicked all everyone's ass in the yeah. The he had a solid team last year. Um, anyway, so yeah, that's that's kind of the update there. Cayman's kicking our asses, but we'll see if we can catch up to him um, here shortly. And that's the end of our show. Thanks for coming along for the ride. Um, I I would love to hear, I didn't say this in any of the segments, but I would love to hear from our audience your thoughts on everything we talked about. If you, if you have any thoughts on the new PlayStation Plus, if you have any thoughts on Kirby, if you're playing Kirby, I know Sydney, a friend of the show, if you're listening, Sydney's been playing it. I'd love to hear what you're thinking, Sydney. Um, to, if anyone's playing Tiny Tina, we'd love to hear about it. Um, sure. And then Breath of the Wild, if you're sad, let us know. Um, and you can let us know by emailing us, mail at spotlightgames.net, or you can DM us on Twitter at SpotGamesPod or Instagram at Spotlight Games Podcast. Uh, thanks for coming along for the ride. Um, I, I have a request for our audience, Cayman. Okay. Request it. I think at this point, you know, we, we have, we're worldwide, baby. We got listeners in Ireland, India, Nigeria. You know, we're, we're making moves across the globe. But the vast majority of our friends are our listeners. They're the ATL's finest stand up. I would challenge you. I would ask you if you have a friend that plays video games, let them know about our show. Say, Hey, I got some friends that do a podcast and I enjoy it. I hope let them know because we're still at a stage where we're growing and we are growing, but best way we're going to grow is through word of mouth. So we'd love it. If you'd share uh, our show with your friends, um, and and yeah, because we 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 like doing it, and we like providing this content for you guys, and we hope you like it. Um, and and we can keep doing that if we grow. So, um, I would love that if you could share it with some of your friends. Um, Cayman, we're here. We are. End of the show. End of the show. Man, do you have, do you have any parting words for our our listeners before we go our separate ways? Oh shit! Yeah, I do. Sorry, should have probably addressed this beforehand. Um, hey. Guess what? Next week's episode of Save Trash Cinema, April Fool's Day. Hey. Hey. 1986, April Fool's Day. So you should probably watch that because it's a huge twist at the end of the movie. And you probably should see it before we spoil it. So, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> love you guys. I love you. I love you. I love you. Bye. <laughs>